Do you get tired of the same old formulaic reviews that you see for every audio product on the market? It's always here are the specs, here's what it's like to use, here's how it sounds, and maybe here's how it compares to some other products. Of course, all that information is important, but it must get dull knowing exactly what to expect. I know it gets dull for me as a creator following that thread all the time. Well, not today, my friends. Today, we're going to talk about music and we'll just happen to cover all the product related stuff along the way. Bruckner's Seventh Symphony popped up as a recommendation on allmusic.com recently, and so I decided to give it a listen. It's a very enjoyable symphony and a great recording of the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra conducted by Manfred Honeck. It's a recording and a performance worthy of a great audiophile chain to reproduce it. I happened to be sitting at a cafe at the time, and so my source chain was a Chord Poly and a Chord Mojo 2. And then I was spoiled for choice in terms of the REMs that I had on hand. And that's because I was about to review the West Tone Mark 60, Mark 70, and Mark 80 REMs. Technically I reviewed the Mark 70 before, but I brought it back in for this one as a comparison to the 60 and the 80 version. I also happen to have the Sennheiser IE900 on hand as another great competitor. Of course, in the name of creating tension and intrigue, I began listening with the cheapest of the options here, and that's the 1,100 US dollar West Tone Mark 60. It's a six driver, three way IEM using all balanced armatures. West Tone say this one's best for vocalists, guitarists, keyboardists, engineers, horn sections, and for studio reference use. They say it's extremely neutral. Using the finale of Bruckner's Symphony No. 7, things started off well. The strings were bright and clear without being harsh. Curiously, the flutes and the clarinets in the opening passages seemed to hover above the string section rather than behind it. And when the trumpets blasted into the mix, they seemed very close to the strings and again above rather than behind. The sounds of plucked cellos and double basses had a lovely tonality and weight from the Mark 60s. And the tonal balance was excellent across the whole orchestra as the volume began to build in this track. It remained excellent for the woodwind passage that followed that gentle crescendo. As I listened and reflected on what I was hearing, I thought that maybe the sound was a touch thicker than I'd expect if I was listening to this recording live or this performance live, but it was definitely all very enjoyable. The horn section soon woke me from that little reverie though, with some blasts at about the three minute mark that the Mark 60s delivered with an excellent sense of texture and energy. At this point in the recording, the whole orchestra sounded massive and imposing from the Mark 60s, as it should. So it seemed like the Mark 60s were a great option, but I'd also only just scratched the surface of what was to follow. Next up was the Mark 70, an IEM that I claimed recently was my new reference at about the 1400 US dollar mark. This one is a seven driver IEM with an interesting split of a single driver for the bass, two drivers for the mids, and four for the treble. Once again, all balanced armatures. Don't be fooled though, the distribution of the drivers does not represent the distribution of the emphasis across the frequency range. These are a full bodied and smooth IEM, which is why I love them. But I was worried that I might have jumped the gun and heaped too much praise on them before hearing the Mark 80s. By the way, West Tones say that the Mark 70s are best for drummers, bass players, electric guitarists, and keyboardists again. And of course, audiophiles wanting more bass. I guess that would be me. Now I know what you're probably thinking right now. It's a warmer and bassier IEM, so it's gonna be less resolving than the more neutrally tuned Mark 60. The most immediate and obvious difference going from the Mark 60 to the Mark 70 was that the sound became way more open and spacious. It was honestly quite shocking. It's true that the sound was smoother and with less emphasis on texture, but don't be fooled into thinking that that equates to less resolution because the Mark 70 was resolving just as much information and perhaps even more than the Mark 60. What was even more pleasing was that the woodwinds and horns now hopped down from their imaginary high perch above the string section and sat in their correct seats behind the string section. It was a much more realistic sound now. When the French horns, or maybe it's flugel horns, maybe it's both, when they had their moment in the sun, they filled the soundstage with a wonderfully rich and warm tone. It was enveloping and delightful. The plucked strings that followed maybe had a little bit less energy than I experienced from the Mark 60s, but they didn't sound like anything was actually missing. And I think that's due to the Mark 70s ability to separate everything extremely well. It makes them more resolving and detailed, and maybe even textured, 
Despite having less emphasis in the treble region, to seemingly reinforce my point, the horn blast at 6 minutes 50 or thereabouts, those were textured and menacing from the Mark 70s. But they also brought the full scale and weight of the whole orchestra to add the drama that's needed. By now, I was feeling really justified in my claims of the Mark 70s being such a great IEM. These are the real deal, but I was still worried that I might have anointed the king of IEMs in this price range at least a little bit too early because I still hadn't tried the Mark 80s. So now it was time. Stepping up to the 1,600 US dollar Mark 80 IEM, we now have an eight driver design, but still using a three-way crossover. Basically, they continue with their four treble drivers, their two mid-range drivers, and now they double up the bass drivers from the Mark 70 and have two running in the Mark 80. But again, that's not a reflection of the tonal balance. West Tone say that these are best for all musicians, for audiophiles, and for studio engineers seeking sound accuracy. Accuracy, what does that mean? What is accurate? Let's find out. I wrote in my notes that the Mark 80s retained the separation and sense of space that the Mark 70s delivered, but with a little bit more attack and a little bit less weight and body to the sound. In hindsight, that's a lie, but we'll come back to that. The horns had a bit more brilliance to their sound from the Mark 80s, and I think that's probably more true to life than what I was hearing from the Mark 70s. What was really standing out though was the sense of space in the soundstage and the placement and accuracy of the placement of each individual sound. It was absolutely spectacular. Thankfully, the tonality across the whole orchestra was again very well balanced, despite a leaner tuning when we look at the graphs. So these might have significantly less bass from a measurement point of view, but they didn't sound lean or cold, and I wasn't missing anything from a tonal perspective. I also found that the sense of resolution and precision from the Mark 80s was next level. I felt like I was hearing every possible sound in the recording, but as part of the whole orchestra. Nothing was artificially separated or incoherent. Instead, I was just enveloped in this wonderful world of music. In fact, the whole experience was quite magical. Hearing the whole orchestra laid out around my head as though I was the conductor standing on stage with the orchestra spread around me. So that all seems pretty clear cut, doesn't it? The Mark 70 is clearly better than the Mark 60, and the Mark 80 is clearly better than the Mark 70. But is it really? This is just one track. What about pop music? What about IMs from other brands? Comparing the West Tone Mark 80 to the Sennheiser IE900, that was an interesting one. The IE900's greatest strength is its coherency, because it uses just a single dynamic driver. Um, yeah, nah. For those of you who don't understand Australian, that means no. In this competition, the IE900 had been beaten. It didn't sound bad on Bruckner's 7th Symphony, but it sounded so different. The IE900 was all separation and texture, but it made the orchestra sound less tonally balanced. Some instruments were enhanced, like the strings, while others got a bit lost, like the horns. There was plenty of texture and attack from the horns, but the body of their sound was missing, so they came across a little bit thin and metallic. For string lovers, the strings were energetic and articulate from the I-900s, especially on plucked notes, but they tended to overpower the rest of the orchestra in the mix. So that might not be ideal, unless you're looking for the Stradivarius remix of your favorite albums. As I said, the IE900s still sounded wonderful. They always do. But I think the cut in their frequency response between 2kHz and 6kHz prevents them from balancing every part of the orchestra with the same skill as was displayed by the West Tones. But let's change things up a lot and try Helen with Fred. The IE900s worked nicely here. Lots of texture and a crisp, snappy sound, but with good weight and speed in the bass. There was lots of emphasis on the upper horn sounds, but it's hard to say what's correct and incorrect on a track like this. The IE900s could be accused of being a bit thin, or they could be lauded as being incredibly textured and resolving. The Mark 80s had a clear opinion on the truth. They showed me the mid-range that was missing from the IE900s version. Suddenly the horns were sounding just right, both textured and with body. The Mark 80s also created more space around all of the sounds because nothing's pushed forward or emphasized in the mix. So nothing's taking up extra space in the sonic landscape. Everything had its place and it was all more tonally balanced as a result, except the bass, which could do with just a touch more body and weight in my opinion. More bass you say? That's the Mark 70 jam. It brought weight to the sound that was unique in this group. It's not quite as tight and punchy as the others, but it's beefy down low. 
However, I felt like the overall tonal balance wasn't quite as good from the Mark 70. The bass is better balanced, but from 200Hz and upwards, the Mark 80 had it beat. And this is where we need to come around to what I said before. I said before that the Mark 80 sounded like a leaner or more neutral Mark 70, with otherwise equivalent separation and soundstage size. Well, here we go again. That was an accidental lie. The Mark 80 is absolutely exceptional with its sense of soundstage size, space and image focus, including image separation. It reminds me a lot of the Odyssey LCD5 in some ways, and that's high praise. Specifically, the Mark 80 provides an insanely open and transparent window into the music. It's one of those IEMs that just disappears and leaves you to explore the music, just enjoy the music or analyze the music, whatever you want to do. It's just amazing. I wanted it to have a little bit more bass, but I didn't really ever miss the bass while I was listening to it. I know that sounds contradictory, but I was always too immersed in the mid-range, the heart of the music, the soundscape and the overall experience of whatever I was listening to. And so, if you want a bit of that action for yourself, I've got links down below through to the Mark 60, 70 and 80 IMs. As you can imagine, I'm most recommending the Mark 80 and Mark 70 before we get down to the Mark 60, which is good, but I don't know that I recommend it as such. However, if you do want excellent tonality and you don't care so much about all the sound staging stuff, the Mark 60 is still really solid. Now, if you're having trouble deciding between the Mark 80 and the Mark 70, or if you want to know more about the accessories like the cable and stuff that comes with these, I covered off a lot more of that in the Mark 70 review, which I'm linking up here. So watch that one next. For now though, I want to say a huge thanks to channel members, to channel Patreon members, and to those of you that leave super thanks on videos like this one. And for now, happy listening, be kind to each other, and I'll see you here next time on Passion for Sound.